Welcome to Tribe Stories. My name is Aaron Mashano, entrepreneur and chief of the Tribe Hut. And each month we bring you an inspiring person or a message with a hope to equip, connect and collaborate with you to help you on your journey to doing remarkable things. Thanks for spending some time with me today and thank you so much for finding our tribe. Now let the sharing begin. Welcome, guys, to another episode of Tribe Stories. Uh, my name is Aaron Mashano again, founder and chief of Tribe Stories, and I am very privileged to have our very own tribe member, Nadia Fabina, who is hailing all the way from Jakarta, runs a few very successful businesses. I won't uh, steal her thunder to tell you how we met, but just really, really honored and privileged to have you on this show, Nadia. And I'm really looking forward to introducing you to the world, particularly the great work you've been doing in such a short period of time. So welcome, Nadia. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you. Very so, generous introduction. Ah, uh, yeah, you are, we're most welcome. Well, you know, I could probably go on for another hour with the amount of experiences we've had. So, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, so, just to go straight into it, actually, because I want to mm-hmm. get a lot of people to hear and learn more from you. Uh, could you maybe tell us about your two very successful brands and uh, their names and what they mean in Indonesia? I know there's a bit of a story on uh, the OTEC piece, but maybe we'll start with the original piece and how you started your, your, your two brands at the moment. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, where do I start? I, I was, uh, before I started this business, this, I was, um, I worked for um, corporation, multinational corporation for 15 years. I was an engineer, actually oil and gas. So um, yeah, so, so, so during, during that working, what do you call, working years, I started to get interested in renewable. Although I was not, renewable was not my field. But there was this aha moment when I was diving, scuba diving, and then I, um, you know, that we had this service interval thing. And then, um, yeah, basically we were on the beach and then um, it was in Raja Ampat and every, everything was so pristine. And then um, there is this, um, all of a sudden I, I smelled fumes and I heard like noisy vo- a voice from the um, diesel generator. And then that was the first moment when I thought, okay, I want to know how to power an isolated island like this. What can we do better for this? So when I was working um, in my previous job, I on, separately, I started to do, um, what do you call it? Um, like separate research on my, on my own. And then, um, yeah, so, so after, after that, that um, I found that for a small island in Indonesia or other small islands, um, there is this a technology that is not very much well known, which is basically um, producing electricity using seawater temperature. And um, I, I'm from Indonesia, so Indonesia has a lot of water, a lot of ocean and it's warm water. So yeah, so I get into, uh, I start to get into it and I started to get into, uh, very interested in it. And so, um, yeah, long story short, I decided to quit my job to focus on developing this technology. I didn't really develop it. I just want to want to um, have um, have a start at first before I met you. So yeah, that's how I started with my first one. After that, after I, I there was still this uh, moment when I thought um, actually I had this uh, master's degree. Uh, basically researching about application of technology in Indonesia. And then there was my professors actually encouraging me to pursue that. Pursue what? I said, why don't you start? At least you, at least you try. So I came back to Indonesia. I had my master's in the UK and I came back to Indonesia and I thought, okay, what should I do? I don't know where to start. I mean, I've been working. I learned a lot of stuff during my 15 years of working, but I never really started um, entrepreneurship. Never, ever done it. So, yeah, that was the moment when I met um, somebody called Aaron Machano. <laughs> <laughs> one one day in a, in a cafe in in in, Kumbang, in Jakarta. So so yeah, um, that's how we we started to meet, right? And then we started to, um, you you started to um, coach me, and then you started to guide me to first have confidence 
I remember those days. And then, um, yeah, after that, we talked about the business itself and then um, started to um, develop it, going to, and then start to connect with people from the technology, from the business, the industry players. That was, that was quite a fun time. Um, yeah, and then I, I was I, I thought I was going to go full on that, and then COVID happened. <laughs> COVID happened, and then okay, hmm. yeah, okay, everybody's uh, everything's closed down. Um, everybody's struggling with their businesses. Okay, what can I do? And so, um, because this technology is dealing with seawater, and one of the potential co-products of this technology. Many things can be can be the output for it, like agriculture, aquaculture, um, desalinated water, freshwater production, as well as salt water product. Sorry, salt production. And so I thought I, I I started to study again about that, and and then when I started to study about salt, I came across artisanal salt, and I learned about it, and um, I I I just thought that. Okay, I, I never knew that this is actually an art, a traditional method that's actually available in Indonesia. And it's a dying art, it's an ancient uh, methodology that is, you know, it's, it's um, and then I start to learn about uh, artisanal oil, the salt, about, about salt itself. Because I, and then basically I, I'm crazy about salt now. <laughs> like, we cannot do anything without salt. I mean, our body needs salt. Salt is very much demonized. Yeah, true. That's another thing. I, I can I can talk about it uh, like for hours. But, but um, long story short, uh, salt is, um, I, I want to do it. I thought, okay. So I start to contact um, farmers. I start to be in touch. I start to, and then um, get the raw materials from the farmers in Bali and then um, I start to experiment in my kitchen and then make it infused salt and I, I love my own product <laughs> I don't know if I can brag about my own product I just yes. love it I love the smell love <laughs> <laughs> I love the smell I just love the taste when I cook with it or I just I just sprinkle on on an I admittedly I don't cook that much but if I if I order food and I just you know it just gives um, enhanced taste and I thought okay and I actually discussed with you right about that so it is um it from outside it looks like two separate businesses but it's actually very related the seawater temperature power production with salt production so yeah well although you said it is two businesses I just think that it's um it's a one integrated business no, definitely, definitely, yeah. And uh, I, I want to say that more for the distinction for the audience to know that there are potentially going to be two different brands, but I think one kind of feeds into the other and vice versa, perhaps. Um, so just maybe for the audience to understand a little bit more, could you describe what OTAKE is? So you mentioned it's uh, seawater generated electricity. But could you maybe explain a little bit about the process so they can understand how uh, that technology works, as you mentioned, and then maybe better make the connection with how salt is produced, just so people get a broader idea of how the business is over, overlap. Okay. So basically, uh, OTEC stands for um, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. Um, it's, it's a bit mouthful, isn't it? But um, <laughs> it's basically um, utilizing thermal, the, um, the temperature of the seawater. And the temperature in the seawater is basically the radiation from the sun that is absorbed in the ocean. So we unlock that uh, um, uh, the sun energy from, from the solar energy from the ocean, we unlock it and that's become the um, um, electricity production. So you can see it as, we see it ocean as a big battery, let's say, <laughs> that actually absorbs all the uh, sun energy so we unlock it with this technology. And the way to do it is, um, it's very simple. It's like, um, it's like making steam. So uh, in right. steam that you, you, if you boil your water in a kettle, right? So you need to boil it to certain, to 100 degrees Celsius if it's, if it's water. 
and then that you have this um, vapor, like a boiling vapor, and then that that's actually used to um, turn the generator, so that the generator is basically producing electricity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's like the steam engine, yeah. but just sort of in reverse. <laughs> Yeah, it's like steam engine, but yeah, exactly. It's like steam engine, but um, we're not using um, water. We're using another medium, another fluid that can boil in 24 degrees Celsius. Uh, I see. Um, yeah. So basically that's so what we need, the, the um, uh, warm sea water from the surface. That's where the sun is actually absorbed. Um, so we, we take that and then we use that warm sea water to actually um, uh, boil, boil this fluid, sort of boil, and then that fluid that is boiled, that's become vapor, that is being condensed again by uh, cold seawater. So we need two pipelines, warm seawater and cold seawater. And then cold seawater is about, it's quite cold, it's about maybe between four to seven degrees Celsius. So it's like a refrigerator. <laughs> so that vapor is recondensed into a liquid state and then that's the cycle so it's quite simple actually so the connection with salt i'm assuming is once the water is being pulled from the ocean and evaporated some of that crystallizes yeah. into salt I'm correct, or is there another process for that okay so the salt itself is different so um the cold sea water that you use um that you use for um condensing the fluid, so that is basically is used for, it can be further used for something else before it's returned back to the sea. Oh, I see. So it can, yeah, so it can be used to produce fresh water because you already, you know, the, the nice thing about the water from the deep sea is that it's very clean and it's also cold and it's, it has a lot of nutrients and minerals. So, um, the deep, the deep sea water that has cold temperature, you take it and then you bring it to the onshore, to the land, and then you can make fresh water production with the desalination plant. And then because salt water, if you make the, uh, desal uh, if, you, if you desalinate it and make it a fresh water, then um, there is brine, right? The, the very thick um, salt, salty water that you can evaporate it and it becomes crystallized and becomes salt, basically as simple as that. Wow, wow, that's amazing. And that sounds all quite environmentally friendly as well, I'm assuming, is that right? And the costs uh, of production are maybe, would you say cheaper or more expensive than uh, the traditional uh, power generated, um, I don't know, plants that we have around? How, how, how do you compete with um, hydroelectric, diesel or, I think uh, really, uh, they also use, uh, not uranium, but there's a uh, radioactive uh, power plant, yeah? So how, how do they compare? Okay. Well, let's compare with diesel. That's the most, um, the most used currently in Indonesia, especially in islands in Indonesia. So with diesel, I studied, um, it's still cheaper. The, the, the technology, the, the, the expensive part of the technology is the pipeline, right? But even that with that, even with that, if you compare it with diesel power, diesel generator, um, you the transport cost of that diesel, because Indonesia, you know Indonesia, right? I mean, it's the west part is the most populated part is where all the activities are. But the, the more you get to the east where the islands are, where OPEC is suited, um, you need to transport the diesel to those islands. And the transportation cost can be quite high. So I did a little, a little study on that, and that the the OPEC is still cheaper compared to um, traditional or currently used uh, methodology, which is um, diesel. I see. Diesel I power see. generation. Yeah. Okay. And what about the environmental side of it? I mean, obviously, diesel we all know from petrochemicals, and I'll come up with a conversation about that because you used to work on the other side of town. So how, how that uh, sits with you, and what's been your transition? But uh, do, you, do you mind sharing more about? environmental aspects of OTEC? Yeah, so I'm happy to say that um, OTEC has no emission at all, like zero, nada. <laughs> so, um, 
So um, yeah, there's no fume, there's no emission at all. So it's um, in terms of um, carbon, car uh, carbon, what do you call it? Carbon oh, content. Emissions. Yeah, carbon. Yeah, carbon emission. emission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's no emission. There's no greenhouse gases emitted. There's no CO two. So yeah, it is basically um, from that point of view, it is um, it is very very clean. Oh. Wow, that's amazing. So how, how, how was it then? Because uh, your history was, from what I know, you worked on the other side of town uh, in the petrol, petroleum. Yeah. So what sort of changes uh, have you had to undergo, be it in mindset or values or perception of trying to, I guess, uh, you know, now working in a zero emissions uh, company of your own versus what you used to do in the past? Has there been any transitions or everything's exactly the same for you? Just curious. Okay, so based, the technology itself is very close to oil and gas, basically. That we, ha we have a lot of, this is thermodynamic principles, it's used a lot in oil and gas too. It's just that the medium, they use hydrocarbon, which is oil and gas, and we're using seawater now. So technology-wise, it, it, I'm very familiar with it. So there's no change, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then what else? All oh, right, right. Two types of people, usually the people on zero emissions, global warming, uh, you know, uh, fans, whether we believe it or not, is not the point. And then there's the other side of there's no such thing as global warming. Uh, emissions don't matter. The world will fix itself. So there seems to be two camps in the world. And I, by, by the way, don't endorse or discourage any of the extremes. I'm just a really curious person who wants to see where's the utility and how can we sustainably you know, look after the planet, whichever side we are. So uh, what's your view on that, I guess, seeing that now you're working on uh, what could seem as the other side of the cap? That's, that's what I was saying. Okay, so um, the company that I used to work for is now, um, is now campaigning net zero. So, um, so I would say even oil comp the big oils, they, um, they, they're moving further to the other side. I would say it's 2050 is a, a carbon net zero um, energy transition that is very, oh, wow. very commonly used terminology now in, in energy world. So um, as, as we speak now, um, everybody talks about zero emission carbon or carbon neutral, at least carbon neutral is not zero emission, but it's carbon neutral. It's, it's not like you emitting, but what you're emitting, you used it again like biomass, for example, but um, yeah, at least carbon neutral, but this is zero emission, but that's what the energy world is talking about at the moment, even the big oil. Okay, so, but when they talk about it now, I've, I'm already in this um, zero emission business, right? So that's what you're asking. Yes. What is this, yes. Yes. my transition? My, yes. um, actually, not so much. I don't really see any any difference. Um, when I worked there, um, we, okay, I know what people think about big oil and oil companies, but when I worked inside the company that was, we, I was part of them, so we were very strict about what was discharged. The one that you knew, that, that you heard from the news, etc. it's, um, it is, Okay. I, okay. I, I hope I don't open any can You don't need to mention brands. Just uh, that's <laughs> all. we stay clear of that. <laughs> this will stay on the recording. So keep okay. going. Okay. That's right. right. <laughs> it, it, is, it, is, it is a big incident, unfortunate incident, but nobody actually inside the company cell, at least what I know, nobody wanted it to happen. It's not like, I know that how people sometimes demonize the fossil fuel pro producers, but um, that is not what happened inside the circle. People want to actually make sure that the discharge level, the, the oil that is discharged, you have, a, at least in my company, I'm not quite sure I cannot speak for all companies. You want to make sure that what you discharge is very little. For example, in every oil uh, production, you need to discharge water too, because there is a bit of water in the, in the oil, and then you need to separate it, and you need to discharge it back to the sea but the discharge water needs to be very clean very pure and then you have a very strict um 
very strict methodology, work process, and very stringent measurement and etc. and reporting um, to make sure that this trace of oil there is or not at all in that discharge water. So I would say, and I I happen to work in those department that making that is making sure that we don't discharge uh, pollutants. So um, I don't see much of the difference. Um, yeah, I, 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 I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned about stringent system. I learned about robust. I learned about showing up. That I use now. I'm, mm. I'm trying to use that in my business, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good insight and that's partly why I queued that question because I think back to the words that you use, a lot of people are demonizing and news is in the business of sensationalizing everything. So it's not uncommon for people just to paint a bad picture of an organization regardless of what the product is. But I think what I'm hearing and what I'm loving to hear is that there are technologies that are transparent and transferable across doing good and doing bad. And that's a big part, I think, that segues oh, yeah. into my other questions about why I believe in entrepreneurship. Some people can capitalize, uh, say capitalists are evil because they're associating with the people who have different values. And then the people with good values use the same systems, the same technology, and end up doing some amazing things in the for the world or the community as you are. So I think for me, what uh, seems exciting, at least for the future, is if the you know uh, fossil fuel industries are looking at zero emissions by 2050, they might potentially use uh, companies like yours to source their energy to do the same job instead of using uh, more old school traditional methods that will maybe borderline more risky. Would that be right to assume that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, um, a, a lot of things you can, I mean, like you said, there's nothing new under the sun. So um it's the application i think of course there is some a lot of things new in, in the energy like like a lot of new researches like hydrogen and many many cool things um they're trying to innovate um it's very interesting times now to follow the news um on energy um, yeah. wow. um but but yeah um specifically in what i do um yeah it's all transferable uh, knowledge that I had from the from back then, uh -huh. definitely, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, it's really exciting. I'm I'm definitely a big endorser of every work you do. So uh, we're really rallying you there. So maybe just for the us to understand more in the entrepreneurial journey now, uh, what would you say are kind of maybe the top three challenges someone in your position might be facing in trying to launch an old tech project or a sole business or both that you might share for people who are maybe aspiring Nadias of the future. At first, it was um, it was I lost the structure from from back then. It's it's um you would say I I look for the freedom <laughs> as entrepreneur, but when I have it, I miss the structure literally. I miss the eight hours working days, like not eight eight to ten. It depends normally eight to 10 hours. It's just, I, I need, I just miss the, um, you know, wake up that you have something to, somewhere to go, something to do, people to talk to, um, chase goals together as a team, you know, like exciting stuff that I took for granted back then. Um, and I really, I, it was the most challenging part. It's still challenging now. It's still challenging. I, I have to create um, a mindset that, okay, um, like virtual team, not virtual, something imaginary team. <laughs> we, we'll talk about that. We know you have a team. <laughs> so because I, I'm a very much, and my characters, I, I like to work together with people and not, and, and achieve goals together. That's what I like to do. That's what energizes me in the morning. So I miss that. I, I just, um, so at first I was very, um, I was very much into daily routine regime. I've created structure that I, I, I come like, like, like fanatic about creating structure that I don't want to lose it. I just want to hold on to structure that if I lost it, I can make it myself. You know, this is daily routine that I have to, to stick to, to stick to it. And I have to do it, you know, like, um, so yeah, that, that was the, the 
the very first uh, challenge, which I still have now, but I start to get to be friends with it. Yeah, I think that's still that's still related. It's um it's a relatively a uh, lonely journey. Uh, for the salt business, it's probably a lot of people doing product based business, right? Especially during COVID now, and um, yeah, people sell stuff. But the other one, you know, <laughs> who does that? <laughs> It yeah, takes exactly. a lot of time to to explain it. Oh yeah, but this is not this. This is that. Oh, this isn't. No, it's not. You know, like when you talk about people renewable energy, they don't they don't think about OTEC. They think about something else. They think about solar maybe or whatever. But uh, or but not OTEC. Yeah. So so um, it takes it takes. Yeah, but I'm doing this. I'm doing that, you know. So it's quite lonely. Um, it's quite a lonely journey. But I, I'm lucky. Um. In the middle of my my uh, journey, let's say, or in the, in the, in the middle, of, like so, something last 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 year, end of last year, that I met this community, and then I met this um, this industry players, these experts, and um, started to be connected with them, and uh, that that means a lot. That I I'm starting to become part of yeah community that understand you know like we talk about the same things and um, although they do different things and they're they're from different countries but um yeah and then um the lonely parts also I'm lucky that i i have your tribe and who that's become my tribe so yes, our um, tribe, definitely. yeah yeah that's um that's like a family that i i i come back to um from time to time um i know it's it's not um it, it's not necessarily different uh, the same type of business yeah nothing is yeah but but um there, there are certain things that apply to starting entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs or just you know people people have their own business there's the, the thing uh, that we share regardless yeah. of what your businesses are right so um, that also means a lot to me. And then I actually need some pers perspective from people outside of tech technology, because um, that give me fresh perspective, how to approach, you know, in terms of business model, maybe in terms of, you know, to think outside of the box and get your energy from it. It's just, yeah, so, so that's the second one. So it's still related to the first one. When you lose the structure, um, there is, I don't know if it's only me, but there, there's a certain, um, nervousness, although you nervous, it's more like nagging. I, I wouldn't even say anxiety, but, um, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. There's this, um, okay. You know, like, um, like, like helpless chicken a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, you can be consumed with making a perfect routine for yourself. You know, you can be, and you can be consumed with anything that is not important because there's nobody that tells you, there's no boss who tell me, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> I can go, I should go here. I can go here and put a lot of energy and doesn't really know that I'm actually off track, you know? So, um, and having to evaluate that in daily basis, it is very tiring. It is very tiring. And I, I felt that, um, and then the feeling that, oh, I haven't achieved a lot in the day, whilst I actually did a lot, but, what did I do? You know, that's um, in the beginning. Um, I, yeah, okay. I cannot say that I don't have that now, but I start to manage it. But it's it's there. Yeah, that's the the, the most. I think one of the big challenges. And then after a while, you feel burnout. No, I won't say burnout, but you feel fatigue and you feel tired and you feel a lack of achievement. Look, you feel like because nobody actually pat you on your back. I used to have my boss, okay, and I did a good job every time. I just do little things and a good job, and I did a good job. Nobody did that. Nobody does that anymore. 
nobody there's no performance review that i can i can you know i can okay okay i'm doing well you know there's all there's just um me criticizing myself me focusing on what i haven't done and that is what i found i think after a year into the journey that i found that's what the root cause of my fatigue mm, that's very powerful yeah yeah i just um i just yeah i i just okay um i know that you are there now and then if there's the coaching session and then you're oh, okay nadia um okay well done i'm proud of you you said that all the time but in my mind i said thank you but in my mind yeah of course he has to do that he has to say that he's my coach i haven't done anything i remember that <laughs> So, um, but yeah, um, yeah, I think that's the most, uh, I still have, um, I still have this um, pull and push even until today. Have I done enough or have I done too much? Have I done enough or have I done too much? Am I being lazy or am I being being too hard on myself? You know, like that's that pull and push is. um, Yeah, the duality. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very clear. And this brings me to the question I've been meaning to ask you in this interview for all these years I've been waiting for is, what are the top three lessons that you've learned from your past self? uh, And how has that molded you to be the leader that you are today? Okay, so from what I, you're saying that what, what I actually get from my past experience, what I, how I apply it and what I learn is that yeah yeah definitely definitely okay um structure (laughs) structure um yeah that's why again that's what I said in the beginning that I yearned when I worked I yearned for freedom but um I learned, oh my God, I learned so much more. I think the technical part, of course, we don't have to discuss about this, that's for sure. I, I learned a lot on that. But also the uh, non-technical part, like the uh, personal growth part. There's a lot of things like, um, okay, this is, this is also what I, I feel now. Um, if I don't want to do it, I can. But back then, I cannot, you know, and that me having to show up when I don't want to show up, that is useful for now. (laughs) I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, give me an example. I think I know what you're saying. Give us an example. Ah, You know, you have to go to the office. You know, you have bad time and then a good time and bad time. It's not like I always, okay positive positive every time no it's not like that there, there are very bad days they're like oh, i don't want to do it why do i need to be in office now but you have to show up you are paid for it you that is your responsibility to show up and then when you show up you better have a good time right otherwise you will be miserable so i learned to find the things um that sweet spot but I still show up when I don't want to, but I still find the enjoyment on it. And that is what, I think that's the most thing that I get from mm. the mental and maybe even spiritual. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. Because um, your emotion, like I don't want to do it, or I want to do it. It's just a duality, right? It's fleeting but your ability to find the purpose when you, even you don't feel like it. Yeah, that, that, that is quite useful for now. For, I, I, I don't say that I, I find that every day, but, but I, I think those trainings of having to do that for 15 years, that, that shapes me like, okay, you have to do it. You know, you just have to show up. And then if you don't show up, it's, it's okay. But yeah, just, just, just show up. And you don't have to be perfect when you show up. At least just show up. So, yeah. But sometimes I'm very tired and I just want to sleep. And I do. <laughs> and you don't feel guilty for it, I hope, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the second part, isn't it? Just not feeling guilty that it's Monday and you 
have to yeah. do this. So, exactly. Or well, Sunday, I should be doing this. I think. You know, exactly. Yeah. Polarizing. So, totally related. And I think that's such an important thing that you mentioned. That is sometimes very hard to translate for people on just how much freedom also has a price. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so really, really happy about that. So you mentioned a bit about the spiritual element. So maybe could you share with us from your experience, what are your spiritual practices that keep you centered and I guess making these conscious choices where you're centered? And uh, do you see a connection in your spirituality with say building your projects and your business at the moment? <laughs> this is a big question. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay so i i do i i i feel a need to stimulate my phlegmatic side and you know that right so i tend to tend to um, feel a need to keep my spiritual practices routine um and um, for me spiritual practices doesn't have to be a big action it has it's just um Okay, so when I wake up, I do some things. I have light exercise and uh, I do open heart meditation and I do natural walking, um, some kind of like walking meditation. Um, yeah, that's what I do. Um, from those practices, I think that also something that I learned from my past, that's this, this still the, the same topic. It's um, um, how can I say this? There is this um, about showing up, right? There is uh, um, there is negative and positive feelings about everything, not feeling emotions about everything. You can label it with anything. I mean, it comes to you, but there is this um, eternal joy, let's say naturally that is already that we are born with it so those practices is actually bring me to be aware of that i wouldn't say that now during the working hours um i remember that i wouldn't say that <laughs> i forget most of the time but actually if i do that at least once or twice in a, in in a day i i i'm in touch with that um joyful feeling let's say yeah and that um and then what is your second question how do i yeah do you see any connection with uh, your spiritual practices and say building your entrepreneurship journey or project at the moment any overlaps yeah yeah um i actually learn okay those practices that i do the routine um that just set me up for the real spiritual practice which is the daily life i believe that the real spiritual practice is the day-to-day -day. it doesn't have to be wow but like now i'm connecting with you i I'm, I'm connecting with others i'm connecting genuinely and truthfully from heart like for example it's not it is already a spiritual practice and um so when i do the the business the entrepreneurship or I learned to, the most thing that I learned is that I think for the time being, I don't know, I think maybe later I have more lessons for the time being it's about not attaching myself to the goals. <laughs> I like that. Can you elaborate a bit more? So um, when you are, okay. And then, and then wrap into that is about pull and push again about, am I doing, am I being laid with the goals itself? It's tricky because, um, because I'm just thinking, how do I want, how deep I want to, to bring it up? <laughs> because um, when you attach too much with a goal, means that you attach yourself too much with the result. And um, I know in theory that it is not the way to do. It will bring you to not so good state, mentally, spiritually. But when you actually do it, who doesn't want to get their goals achieved, right? So, 
you will put so much effort in focusing on your goals, which means you're focusing on your result. Yeah. While you yeah. have only have control over your action. That is, although I know in theory, and I think it's all in all the books, a lot of, you know, I won't say holy books, but, you know, like this. Spiritual books, and new age. Yes, book. Yeah, books that has a lot of wisdom. I think it's written anywhere that, um, uh, that you only have control over your action, but not on the result. But how can you work without goals? You cannot. So goals has to be there. But how can you, how can you, how can you um, do the goals without actually being attached to the goals itself? So for me, it's still, um, I understand this, that this is, I think this is the essence in whatever I do. I think, um, I feel um, this is, this is, there, there's a big, very big lesson on it. And I would never master it probably, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think um, I think that is uh, what I found in this business journey. It's very magnified. Back then, when I was working, um, you still work for somebody else, right? Um, you still have goals, but that's the goals of the team that you supported, and you know. But this is your own, so the attachment is a lot larger. So that's um, what I, that's actually also, I think, contributed to my fatigue in the beginning. Because I'm attaching too much to my goals. So I'm magnifying what I haven't done rather than being grateful what I have done, you know, because the goals is not there yet. So there is also a, in the art yeah. of setting goals. Is that realistic enough? Is that your ambition? Or is that, I mean, you know, those things. Uh, and and then nobody feels, exactly. Yeah. Nobody's telling you. Nobody's, no, no bosses, no bosses, bosses that telling you, okay, this is really not in line with our business goals. But you said it yourself. And sometimes I think most of us, maybe you included, I'm definitely, I put um, goals that is not realistic. So yeah, it same. gives me stress. Yeah, it gives me stress. But I don't have to have stress. It's self-inflicted. And this because I have the freedom again, which is double sword, a uh, double edged sword. I have the freedom to to actually um, set the goal myself, so I can be as high or as as low as I can. And you know, it's um yeah, I'm still struggling with that. But um, now I just let go. This is all theory. Just let go, and then I just remind myself I only have a control i actually don't have control over my <laughs> but, but <Yeah>. actually <laughs> actually if you have to have control it's only on your action but not your result yeah yeah, yeah. so but it's um yeah it, you can imagine how difficult it is right yeah to yeah result. no definitely and i think what you're sharing and what i'm hearing is you know setting goals is necessary for us to progress and feel this sense of meaningfulness in our work and in our life and feeling progressive but at the same time we don't have to stress ourselves by attaching ourselves to that goal in terms of a set egoistic time frame because we may achieve it we may not but even what my coach says spiritual coaches you know he has this quote that was uh please help me attract what i think i deserve but if something better comes along i will be grateful for that too yeah. And I think over time, we evolved to something even better than we thought at the time we made those goals. So it's actually, as you said, a bit fictitious to, uh, uh, or, or maybe not practical to attach ourselves to the goal because that in itself may evolve. But it's nice to have it as a game, at least for me, the way I understand it, it's just a game, you know, that I want to play for someone that can play it. Right. And I go in with that fun you talked about, the enthusiasm, and then explore and expand with it. And then maybe... My preferences may change, but I'll pursue it for as long as it's enlightening to me. Yeah. 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 True. But I remember what you said: detachment equals flow. I think this related, right? With this detachment, atta detachment to what? To your goals? I think. <laughs> no, I totally agree. Maybe explain where you got the detachment equals flow, and you mentioned phlegmatic. These two terms we use in our tribe language. <laughs> the audience may not know so you want to break that down what your interpretation of those two word terms are i mean in my line of business maybe 
maybe if you're a creative person, like creatively in terms of art, you're probably more familiar with state of flow. <laughs> With my in my line of business is about goal setting, is about structure, about putting spreadsheet and blah, blah blah. Okay, what is flow in that? You can be in flow when you're absorbed in the moment of doing your spreadsheet, probably, which sometimes happens. It yeah, happens. yeah, definitely. I get that yeah. in Excel for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. I don't. I I I have to agree. But um, so I I translate that to that. Um, Interpretation. That's my interpretation. Yep, absolutely. Flow. Spot on. Spot on. Being being so absorbed. But what is what does it mean with detachment equals flow? If you uh -huh. know flow is basically you're absorbed in that moment and you're in that state of flow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think it's good. And I think you know we're running out of time because I know you and I can can go on and I hope to get you back on. We will maybe have more of a spiritual segment because okay. I've never actually interviewed and shared at the same time those 10 philosophies from, I mean, you've seen them in the programs, but uh, I think just to put it back to you, because this is about you and what I'm grateful for having you on the show is about is you are someone who's implementing a lot of what I hope I teach, at least from a results point of view. And for me, just to help you with why I think you understand it better than you said, mm. is you mentioned you need goals, but you can't be attached to the result. So that in itself is the detachment. Mm -hmm. That's my interpretation now. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> that is what the detachment component ah, okay. means. Is yeah. that you can create and uh, uh, you know have a fun desire to want something, but you have to be detached from the outcome of how it shows up, and that it gives you the peace, which is flow. That gives you the creativity to be able to. What's that saying? Uh, I share with you guys often is um, plans goals in concrete but plans in sand you know because you've got to move in the plans some plans don't work COVID happened people who are not so attached to the goal they were that they were just their business yeah more yeah. uh effortlessly yeah? yeah the people who are so attached like no i've put in 10 years 20 million dollars on x we have to do it this way there's no more market for it yeah. they they will not flow into opportunities so, uh, yeah. so I think you've actually got it. So based on what you just said, to me, at least from the journey we've been on, I remember that was one of the biggest opportunities. I said, which one do you think you're going to struggle in the 10 philosophies? We talked about this one. And uh, it was connected to your energy as well, if you remember. Yeah. But you really played the detachment really, really well, I believe. Uh, you know, in all the evolutions in the business, including that where you are now running your own teams and trusting yourself more which is that trust the process part, right? Um, which creates more flow also, because yeah. it's coming from you originally. So I'm super proud. And I know you think I say that because I have to, but uh, I think if there's anyone who's it's come to- It's of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that. But no, it's true. But for someone who has come from engineering and come from this pragmatic world, I think you've really evolved into this uh, uh, component of detachment equals flow and, and back to what we're talking about now I think it's because you already knew it but uh, perhaps correct me if I'm wrong here you had it already in your spiritual practices before I met you but the engineering and the business seemed to be a different thing and I think mm -hmm. I can't remember which session it was I just loved it I actually got all emotional you started to merge your engineering and spirituality together so could you maybe, uh, we have so little time, but just maybe share a little bit about how that happened for you. And what does it mean now that you're integrated with both being the engineer, the entrepreneur, the spiritual person? I mean, what does that actually look like for you and how does that feel? I'm really curious. I think a lot of people need to hear this because this is the secret ingredient we can't put in any program or website, but I think it's actually the foundation of how people can flow better in their businesses. So would you like to share that integration and how that happened for you? This is a big question. Um, I think the engineering part, it's, it's all in the application, right? So um, the spiritual part, like what we discussed about detach detachment and flow, and, and that is, I, I, I put that as a, your spiritual element. That's what makes you you, that what makes you doing some action. <laughs> um, but the manifestation for me is through what my past 
is, which is engineering. And I, I, I might not be um, also maybe the, I might be, I might not be a typical engineer. I mean, I, I, I have this uh, comments many, many, many times from people in and outside of engineering. <laughs> but um, I, I, yeah, the, the way I work, my mind is also, you know, like logic and like you said, a bit more pragmatic rather than, you know, typical spiritual person. <laughs> so I, 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 um, I'm always, I always felt that I was not here, not there, you know, but, but now I, I thought, okay, it's um, my spiritual practices. Um, that, that is what, um, that is the reason why I do what I do. And that element for the time being is through engin um, in inter engineering entrepreneurship. <laughs> what do you call it? Engineering entrepreneurship. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe later, I don't know it. I've, I've, I've like become entrepreneur, I've become a serial entrepreneur. There will be non-engineering entrepreneurship or whatever, whatever else I do. Um, that is the manifestation of these principles. I think that's that I start to merge. I mean, there are there are activists out there. There are yoga teachers or there are um, celebrities. They all um, they all share their if they have spiritual practice and they they, um, they they all share their not through preaching only, but also through actions. And their action is based on their background. If they're celebrities, probably they they they. They appear more in, in whatever media, if they're um, teachers, maybe they preach more than a teacher. But if you are if you're somebody that a writer or, or a, somebody, a musician, it is reflected in, in that whatever one to do. So no, that's that's really beautiful. And and I think just hearing you articulate it, and I know you're a little bit like me, we process information, but sometimes we're voicing it out helps to crystallize yes, some yes. of these things. I, I, I think looking back to this, it will be super, super useful for other practical people and also spiritual people to see that, you know, there is an opportunity for us to merge both and not think one is a separate form, but actually just the other side of the same coin. Yeah. At least that's been my experience. And I guess that's the tribe approach to, to how I want to do things moving forward is bring people more together because an artist is an entrepreneur in their own right. An engineer can be an entrepreneur. And the only difference is you build an enterprise in, or a project. And that's the only distinction, but yeah. you could do that in a team or such your own thing, obviously. Um, so maybe just a couple of final questions because uh, uh, we seem to eat up time so quickly every time we connect, but uh, who, just curious because you've taken on such a mammoth of a project and uh, very courageous and brave of you, but who would you say are the people that have impacted you the most in your life that contribute to your success and happiness today? My husband. Yes, that's why I asked. Please <laughs> tell, us, tell us more. I... I... Yeah, it, it's um well he's an engineer too. So um we speak the same language, too similar sometimes. Um, but that helps. <laughs> um he believes in, I mean, I cannot imagine if I if I do this thing and I, I mean I, I know that happens in uh, I, I mean in other outside, you know, like you need to also maintain, oh, I need to make sure that my husband or my wife gets the same attention that I did when I do my business. I'm very lucky, very grateful for that. I don't have that problem. And actually, um, actually we do things together now. We do it together. Um, and um, it is more like complimentary. <laughs> the complimentary, the way we work is similar but different and we use it in different things in things that we commonly do together so yeah and um we believe in the same purpose we have um yeah and um a very very competent person <laughs> it is and he understood um he understood my mission he and it's, it's also his mission but um I don't have to talk much, let's put it this way. I don't have to spend time to explain too much and he gets it. 
and he he knows where I'm I'm getting crazy <laughs> because I do that a lot. <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> and yeah, more like my anchor and my rock. Yeah. So if he was here, what would you say you admire the most in his characteristics that make you really appreciate him as one of your uh, influential people? Um, I think we are the same pragmatic person. So we can speak on that level. And we are a very fiery person too. <laughs> um, the same type of temperament, let's say. But what I, that, 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 that means a lot because I don't have to make myself small. Uh, sugar coat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have to be too careful. Um, that's also the thing that um, I don't have to make myself small. It is very important because um, can you imagine that if, if you do things like this and then your spouse would say, what are you doing? Don't, don't you think this is too crazy? Don't you think who are you? Can, who? I mean, people would probably get that challenge, but not this guy. He's like even actually very supportive not very supportive, he's, he's in it. He's like, okay, remember the thing that I talk about structure and then there's no guideline and we talk things about things together and then he can he can give me um, insight. Oh, you're, you're doing too little, you're doing too much. You're doing too little, but too much stress. You know, he can, he can give me that feedback, you know, like, um, and also the thing that I appreciate most is the willingness to listen and the willingness to um, solve problems together. Let it be internal problems like between us or external problems like we are a team for a common goal, let's say. No problem, but common goal. So um, wow, yeah. That's we work well together in and out, let's say. And um, yeah, I just cannot imagine doing this and then have to still uh, not being supported by somebody that I live together with. But now instead of that, we are a team now. So that is very, I didn't, yeah, I mean, I had my, 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 vision back then this is going to be a life that maybe I'm lucky enough to have but I have so I'm very grateful to for that you know and that is only because he is there yeah I love it I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned him because I was hopeful for that uh, my time uh, my time yeah and uh, I personally have had the privilege of dropping in with him on a few of our sessions and uh, yeah, definitely a very inspiring couple you guys have been and very complimentary for sure. And I'm sure there's other people, but obviously we can't uh, get into that, but I was hopeful I can get you back on the show because the next question I was dying to share with the audience is, uh, you know, you are a woman, you're from Indonesia, a developing country, and you know, I'm sure there's challenges with being a leader in this space uh, that uh, may have come up, but I was hopeful maybe just quickly you could summarize how is it like being a female entrepreneur in the space and, and are there any challenges with that that you come across in some cases, be it social, political, economic or assumptions? And if so, how do you overcome those challenges just to inspire some more female entrepreneurs to take up the, um, take up the torch? Okay, there are a lot of aspects, but um... In terms of, um, I never, so far, I never experienced me being held up, held back, sorry, being held back um, because of my gender. I was lucky. I worked in my work experience, um, the company that I worked for. I speak highly in that for that company. It is true because, um, they, they put a lot of emphasis in diversity. So, but I know there are a lot of energy companies that so much into, oh no, that the teams are all males, let's say. But this, this is more, okay. 
so I, I, I never had problems in terms of um, opportunity, let's say. It is uh, sometimes maybe stigma, I would say. Um, and it is, um, it is not because people want to be bad. It's probably more um, yeah, just automatic, probably. Oh, oh, a girl, oh, a girl. <laughs> um, and then you need to speak louder then you get the intention. If I would be non-female, then I would be male, I would probably don't have to speak that loud, but in the beginning only, in the beginning only, you need to speak louder, you need to not speak louder, but you need to show more, I think. But I honestly, um, Oh, yeah, it just it's because, but it, it comes with my choice. It comes with my choice because it's a, it's a very male dominated world. So um, it is masculine in terms of energy, you know, achieve um, masculine energies, achieve structure and blah, blah, blah you know, like um, future and then, um, you know, like achieve, 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 go, 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 go. So um, also, not only that, it's, um, I, I worked offshore many times and um, yeah, it is very masculine testosterone field environment. Um, I was a tomboy, so I didn't, I didn't have problem with that. I kind of, okay, you know, I, I don't have problem at, at all. I, I know that I now I don't really look like a tomboy, but when I was a small, when I was child, I, so I don't have problem with that. But um, I can imagine it's probably a challenge of, um, for, for, um, many, many women that, is, that, that are not very familiar with that environment. It is still a male dominated world. I don't know, I, I don't have gender study background. So I don't know if um, that is because there is discrimination. Let's just put it, the word up there. If there's discrimination in the field, I don't think so now. But maybe there is, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. So I cannot speak up, uh, speak up about that because that's not my experience. Um, but it could be just naturally. Naturally, um, women are taught not like, it's not your field. I don't know if it's conditioning or some people, well, maybe some people even say that it is not your, the way the brain works and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. That is the stigma. That is very bad stigma. And I think, I want to, I just hate stereotyping. <laughs> I just hate stigma stereotyping. So everyone, I want to say to um, the younger girls and younger females, um, if people say that to you, don't listen. Because that is where the stigma and stereotyping starts and you start to believe it and it limit, it's limiting. So um, yeah, I think um, the challenge for me, it's, I don't really have challenges, I said that, but I do have wish that there is more, there are more females in the field. And I don't know why there cannot be. And I, I think that's because of social, maybe there's a social conditioning factor. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I hear you. And that's why I wanted you on the show to, to showcase a, a version of success, because I think a lot of us are just also hungry for different types of role models. And if they maybe look like us, or they sound like us, or they have a trajectory that we can choose, for example, some Indonesians may think they have to be in Holland to become a civil engineer or do what you do, but you really don't fit that mold. You are from a country like Indonesia. 260 plus, I think now, million people, and you still chosen to take certain paths that have opened you up to other opportunities. So that's very inspiring. So maybe just one or couple of final questions here. Uh, who do you then want to be a hero to? Could be a person in your family or community or interest group specifically, but is there anyone in particular you'd like to, that you can think of that you'd like to be a hero to? I don't have, no. Okay, I'll set you up as a, the final sending note from your coach. I'll set you up for the challenge to find one to five people that you'd like to be a hero to. Because uh, you remember in our peak performance, they say find your why, it helps with demonstrating courage. So that'll be interesting. Outside me and Martin, of course, and the cats, we, we already discussed. Okay. That. 
So um, you, you got that to think about for the next time. Uh, okay, so so final notes. Uh, time has just flown up. Uh, so here's a couple of last questions. Um, you're working on a few things at the moment. So is there any specific part of your project that you're very excited about that you'd like the audience to know about? And if so, how do we also then reach you uh, to get in touch with you? So maybe you can just share a little bit about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, no, I'm, I have just, um, I just had launched uh, my consult business. Um, it's still in early stage. Of course, there's still a lot of revision and all that, but um, yeah, it's, um, it's called Butirsi Salt. You can find it in Instagram. Mm, it's artisanal sea salt. Um, the infusion, I make it myself, it's handmade. Um, also handmade by the farmers, the raw materials. And it's actually um, very tasty <laughs> for your food. So if you want to try, um, yeah, just, uh, just boot tier, it's B-O-E-T-I-R, -E sea salt, boot tier sea salt. So that is um, my sole business. And for Otec, you can look up um, about the technology. I'm, I'm actually part of the association, the Global Association. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, www.ocean-thermal.org. Um, it's very interesting. It's, uh -huh. um, this technology supports blue economy, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which means um, supporting self-sustaining villages. Yeah. Um, from seawater and conservation of seawater and ocean and all that very um very trendy topic yeah no <laughs> definitely definitely love it i love the pitch there too and uh, you told a story to me i think about japan or oh, is it india where some people were also extracting seaweed and, and so many spin-off industries were created just around the area where they were attempting uh, to do the electricity, but stopped halfway with just uh, extracting the water from the deep sea level. So uh, very, very much encourage people to do that. Now, you also have a podcast, I heard. Oh, do you yeah. want to maybe just share that with us as well? Maybe we could hear more about that from that uh, podcast. Yeah, it is actually still, uh, I just started it. It's just the first episode. Um, that is, um, I met this uh, colleague from uh, Brazil and um, we thought, okay, why not we make a um, podcast? Um, he's, he's quite experienced in, um, he, he has his own podcast. Um, but he, yeah, he, he thought that I'm very passionate about, about the subject. And so why not we, we make a podcast together? And the objective is to raise awareness because this technology, Otec, is not really mainstream yet. And I'd like to contribute to promote it. I think it's, um, it, it deserves the attention um so yeah a little action is through podcast through the association of course we will have programs in association and the podcast itself it's not part of the association at least not yet um but it's just me and my my colleague uh, rodrigo and um yeah we want to promote it and talk about ocean and basically raise awareness about it and we're trying to be a little bit more try to have a, the language to be a little bit more um, uh, down to earth um, and mainstream. So, and then we, we want to invite also guests who is related to ocean and ocean energy, anything related to the use of ocean, let's say. Yeah, it's a called Ocean Energy Podcast, by the way. Awesome. That's uh, that's what we're after. That's good. Uh, yeah, I th and I and I heard it. It's really insightful. And like you said in the beginning part of this interview, when we're launching these, uh, what we call moonshot ideas, which are new. I think Netflix had that experience when they launched, uh, you know, Apple to some degree with their nanotechno, uh, with their, you know iTunes or any pioneer that's kind of not yet mainstream that people don't know and most times unfortunately when people don't know or understand it they shun it but I just wanted to acknowledge you uh, lastly to say you know you're very courageous and I think having that opportunity to not just do a practical business that people relate to like salt's been around for thousands of years if that uh, you know you're also building the bridge to educate us on more zero emission technologies that are very trendy and have so many multiple, I think you call it blue economy opportunities for people. So this is just the beginning. So that takes an enormous amount of courage 
and opportunity to be, keep persisting. And I think I just wanted to acknowledge you from the bottom of my heart to say uh, super, super proud that uh, you're pioneering this and you're doing it not just for yourself, but for future women and uh, the country. So that's just really inspiring. So thank you for continuing the hard work uh, on that. For sure, for sure. Um, so just final questions. Um, what would you maybe say, uh, well, this section I like to call final truths, just to close off. But in the final truths, I would like you to imagine that, you know, you've done everything you wanted to do, accomplish, you've uh, lived the life you wanted to the full, you are now ready to go to the next life. You've maybe written books and, you know, I'm going to force you to do that. Uh, you've done your podcast, you've got interviews done, but all the content and books and everything that you've ever accomplished, including your projects, have to go away to the next life with you. So you're only left with a pen and paper and you're being asked to just share three truths or three lessons to leave behind for people to remember you by. So what are those three things that you love people to remember you by? Uh, what will be your three truths? I want to remember as somebody as that is, um, okay, so support. Um, I think this pandemic, it really opened up my eyes. Um, we were moving so fast before and um, this pandemic, it kind of like, in a way I, I feel uh, very comforted <laughs> because it comes back to a, a, a natural state, which is what is important for you, what is important for me. And that's really connection and support, being supportive with one another. Um, I start to realize that um, that is very important and I want to be there for people that really, really needs, really needs to support. And then, yeah, so that's one. And then the second one, um, don't listen to stereotype. <laughs> really, if I, if, I, if I can just live the world with one message, that's just um, don't listen to stereotype. Don't give in to people trying to label you or anything because as soon as you say yes to it and you start to put limit in any, I mean, don't, 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 don't put yourself in boxes. Um, the third one, choose joy, really. <laughs> um, <compa> <laughs> <laughs> that's related to what we discussed in the first, first place about um, showing up. I don't know if, if it's not for me, I don't know, maybe I'm a masochist. For me, the term <laughs> choosing joy is not about la 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 la. It takes discipline. I don't know if you actually connect joy and discipline, <laughs> but for me, there is connection because you need to be aware. Your brain needs to tell yourself, choose it because it's there, but you tend not to see it because you focus too much on what is not going right. We discuss about that. So it's just like a summary, like when I, 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 when I discuss about, I tend to, to um, focus on what I haven't done. So it gives me fatigue. So this is, it, it takes discipline for me to get out of that and then choose grateful gratitude. And gratitude gives you energy, gives you basically, I think, I think actually that's why you are here. The, your, my purpose is to learn to choose that over the other one. I really like those three. Uh, just last two questions. So what do you define as a tribe? Uh, and what does that mean to you so far in your journey? And how would someone qualify to be part of your tribe? All right, okay. A tribe is people that, that um, you, you, can, uh, you can connect well and probably you have a similar mission and then you can support, come back to support again. Um, you can be open to, um, you can be yourself. You can be out of that stigma stereotyping. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, that's, um, that would be my tribe. Uh, I like that. Trust. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. That's why we love you. So what's uh, your definition of living a meaningful life? 
final question. Okay. Um, meaningful life means um, coming back to the the, the, the third uh, the third point of um, about choosing joy. Like you live it, and then you probably guide others to be able to do it to, together with you. Kind of like collaboration. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that sums it up for me. Um, really, um, just being aware that the joy is always there, and then but you need you need to be aware. You need to choose it, and then support each other in doing so. Yeah, and it can be manifested in 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 a project, in a business. It's up to you, but the essence is that for me. Huh. Nadia Fabina, thank you very, very much for your time, your open heartedness, your shares, the integrations on your journey, the challenges and the people that are inspiring you. I'm really, really happy and I've been really looking forward to this interview because uh, we've been on this journey together from the beginning. So just want to say I'm very deeply honored. Hope I can get you back on the show because I know there's so many parts we can go into in a lot more detail. So uh, yeah, we'll put all the details for everyone to connect with you on the comments page and also maybe later some minutes so people can go straight to the topics they're most interested in. Uh, but Nadia, thank you very, very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Aaron. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Never on the beat.